focus focus up i'm talking to you lana thanks for doing all you're doing for the rubio method.com we really appreciate it welcome to the rubio method this is episode 33 that's right episode 33 of the rubio method my name is chris rubio along with let's go with duke duke nicholas monahan i, I don't know if that's up or down from lord monahan but we're just going to go with it we have a great show for you today thanks for always sharing it on apple spotify youtube google amazon and of course the ngbn.tv network here's what we have in store the benefits of telehealth i don't know what that is but i'm sure monahan was going to tell us baby talk finding a happy place are monahan and i classy jack nicholson movies the best concert in your home, funding the police, fixing college football, being soft but tough, all of that and much, much more on today's episode of The Rubio Method. Christian, I'm out. Focus. Focus up. I'm talking to you. Her name is Chastity. Everyone will know who knows. Don't worry about it, Monahan. Monahan, we have a great show today. We obviously had the intro. Then we have the minute with Monahan. We have a couple email questions that people have sent in to Rubio at the Rubio method.com. A phenomenal interview with Rick Carr. You'll find out more about him later. And then the bottom line segment. Monahan, it's your turn. Minute with Monahan. And let's keep it to a minute, Monahan. I know. I've been getting off the rails a little bit lately. <laughs> What is up, you guys? Uh, we got an awesome one today. We're talking about the benefits of telehealth, right? So us guys, we hate going to the doctors. I hate it. You hate it. Everybody, all the guys we know can't stand it. Well, a lot of times we do need to go to the doctors, and a lot of times it's something that's super simple, super easy. And something that not a lot of people get, not a lot of guys know, is that a lot of your insurances will offer free telehealth. And so the reason why I say this is because your overall wellness is very important to your mental health, right? And so what you can do is go and check out your insurance provider. They have a whole list of telehealth doctors they provide. You just sign up, get it, and you can get it fast right away. And then you'll be talking to a doctor within 20 minutes. It's oh, I, I, I hate to cut you off, but I'm going to cut you off. What is telehealth? Oh, telehealth. Oh, yeah, you're right. I should say it. it's a Zoom doctor. Me, <laughs> It's a Zoom doctor appointment. Sorry oh. about that. I should have mentioned that earlier. <laughs> it's a Zoom doctor appointment. And they can prescribe you uh, whatever you need. It's amazing. Wow. And th this yeah. is a real thing. Was this before the Rona or did the Rona kind of spice this one up? I think the Rona spiced it up, but uh, the first time I used it was in 2020. So I'm not 100% sure. I would assume yes, uh, but it's been, it is amazing, especially if you ever get like skin problems or whatever. You just need an antibiotic. You just meet them. They'll send it to your, your antibiotic to your local grocery store and off you go. And you're talking to a real human being like you and I are talking right now. I'm not talking to a recording in, you know, Switzerland. Right. The person may be in Switzerland, but uh, the it's doctors from all over the world. And so, in fact, my son had a, wow. a, a diaper rash. Yeah, my son had a diaper rash the other day. <laughs> and we had a doctor from, I think, either like Ukraine or something like that. And she was good, gave us the prescription. Now he's good to go. So that's why I wanted to talk about today. Here's, here's Jet's butt cheeks. What's going wrong? Yeah. Can you see the problem right here? You see how they're red? <laughs> wow, Monahan, you taught me something. I did not know this was a real thing. That's awesome. I, I bet a lot of guys, because like you said, dudes are just, yeah, I'd rather not go to the doctor, you know, hear evil, see no evil. This is a really good one. This is a good one, Monahan. It was, and it was under a minute, even though I had to tell you what is telehealth. We'll just pass <laughs> it up. Good job, Monahan. What's our email questions that people have sent into Rubio at the Rubio method.com? Yes. So first one comes from Frida in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, Frida asks, keeping on the pregnancy theme. Our, fa our fans love the pregnancy theme. I'm not I sure what should. it is with you. Uh, but keeping on the preg pregnancy theme, are you guys into the whole baby talk for your babies? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All I do is talk to Jenny. As, hey, hey, Rubio, this shouldn't come to any surprise to you. You've met my wife and I. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't surprise me, Monahan, but in, in my heart of hearts, I was hoping maybe I was wrong because I, <laughs> even Christian, big surprise. I, I was <laughs> I, I was hoping that, you know, I, I know he's going to say this, but just, you know, give me one. Give me one. Go ahead, Monahan. Keep talking. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say, we talk to Jet and Baby Voice all day long, and I absolutely love it. What about you, Rubio? If you had to guess, Monahan, I can't even tell you how much I loathe 
baby talk. I, I, I my, and the worst part is, is that everyone knows that I hate baby talk. So my wife turns the baby talk volume up to 10 and she'll do it to damn a diet Pepsi. Oh, look at that diet Pepsi. Okay. And she does it to the dog and I cannot stand it. I I've spoken like this to all my kids from day one. What you see is what you get. And they'll be like, you scare the baby. He's heard it for nine months in the womb, man. He's got to get used to it by now. Number two, I only, I don't, I, I only, I only don't only don't only protest baby talk. I protest any sort of baby type music. So like, you know, the kids bop a hundred percent out They don't even bother trying to put that on my stereo. When Damon, this is a true story. When <laughs> Joel is going to kill me. Um, when, he was a baby and to get him when he would start crying, you know, changing his diaper rash, you know, telemarket or whatever it was called telehealth. <laughs> we used to play that song. I, I can't remember who would play as uh, ludicrous or something like that to the window. Oh, to yeah, the wall. Well, well, and you know like what that. the next line is to the sweat drips. Yeah. We'll just, we'll just leave it at that. It was hilarious because he loved that song and he would shut him up at all times. Great parenting one-on-one by Rubio. All right. Monahan, let's take question number two. That's fantastic. Well, I have to say, I know your kids and they turn out really well. So maybe that's yeah, not too bad. A little rough yeah. around the edges. <laughs> Next question comes from Frank in Strong Island in New York. Uh, Frank says, where is your happy place? Meaning, is it in your head or actual location? Rubio, I'll let you go. My happy place is in Harrison, Idaho. It's about two hours and 15 minutes north of where I live right here in Lewiston, Idaho. And the best place there is uh, there's, I have a little cabin there. And about 315 steps to my right is a, a place called One Shot Charlie's owned by Whitney and Jordan. Um, on that note, they have a, they're always looking for summer help. So if you go to oneshotcharlies.com or .net, I think they are still looking for summer help. It is a phenomenal place. If you ever go to Harrison or Idaho, make sure you visit, but don't stay because that's my happy place. Monahan? That's good. Actually, uh, that's so funny. Uh, my happy place is actually on my Harley. Uh, I told you the other day, this past weekend, I drove my Harley from Denver, Colorado to uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And so, uh, yeah, so I was happy the entire time. My mind was so cleared. It was the absolute best. Uh, so that is my happy place. But the funny thing is my second happy place here is in Minnesota, a place called Charlie's on Prior. So it, there must be something with Chuck and Charlie because I love that place. Okay. Okay. And is it a bar grill? What is it? Yeah. It's a bar grill that you bring your boat up to. You oh, can okay. Dunk, yeah, same, same type of place. Same type of place. Exactly. As when, you when, you to, outside, when you went to, when you went from Colorado to Minnesota, I'm not much on geography. Did you pass through Milwaukee? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Just, see, I wasn't sure if you went to the museum again. Monhead, what's the third question we have? <laughs> Next time I go, uh, if you're not in there, I'm flying you out. We're going together. <laughs> Last question. Uh, this comes from Tanya in Carlsbad, California. Tanya asks, do you guys consider yourself cultured? Would you go see plays or operas, etc.? I would consider myself cultured, but I wouldn't go to plays or operas or anything like that. I feel like Actually, now that I think about it, I don't think I am cultured. Uh, I like. Yeah, I was sports. gonna say you you have to be anti-culture if you don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All I do is like sports. So uh, I would say I, when I read this question the other day, I was like, uh, I was like, yeah, I am. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> Monaghan, I would have to say, if you had to guess, am I cultured or not? I'd say no. I don't think you'd like plays or operas. Monaghan, I love them. You what? Uh -huh. I absolutely do. I've seen all as many plays as possible. Um, operas, I have not. I think that's a little too much for me. I'm not sure what, what's happening, and I don't want to think that much. I, I went to two plays that I hated, and it was the two plays that I, I've been to, like, let's say 15 plays, and most of them I loved. I loved them all. Um, but the two that I absolutely hated was A Phantom of the Opera. Okay. I was sitting too close, and they had this microphone that was like, duct tape to their head and so it kind of hung right here and so all i could do is focus on the damn microphone and i was like well, there's got to be better technology at this point and then this is several years back i'm in chicago and we go to the concierge at the hotel and we said let's go see a play and he goes okay there's a, a matinee or whatever during the afternoon obviously this is new play everyone's raving about it it's called hamilton and i said <laughs> okay and i go okay let's go and so it was just an old theater and it was the actual broadway crew and all that and I, i'm not petite so the older theaters are built for tiny, teeny, tiny people. 
So I sit down and I'm like fat guy in a little coat. I can't even squeeze, you know, I'm oiling up my sides to get in there. And we start watching it and it comes out and I, I, I know nothing about Hamilton at all. I know nothing. I just know, oh, it's a good play. Everyone has seen it. You got to see it. You got to see it. You got to see it. Okay. So they come out and this dude starts rapping. But it's like a bad rap. It's like an eighth grade talent show. Like, my name is Hamilton. And here I am to say. And I I literally looked at Joel. I go, what the hell is this? I thought that we were being filmed like we were being punked. And so it just keeps going with this bad rapping. And I'm looking around and everyone's loving it. There, there were a thousand people in there. Oh, my God, this is the best thing ever. It was so bad. I left at halftime or intermission, whatever the hell it's called. I literally said, we're getting the hell out of here. I don't care if I'm losing a hundred bucks. I'm gone. So Monahan, I'm cultured, yet I'm not cultured. I don't know. What's the answer? I don't know, but I'm surprised because I watched Hamilton and I loved it. But I hate it. It, it is was long, so bad. Dude. I thought it was a joke. I, I was like, this is like in eighth grade, I could have created better raps. <laughs> dude that's the craziest thing i love the soundtrack so i'll listen to it on my own oh i, I like the two i like the two or three king songs oh yeah uh, what that that dude he he crushes it the rest you're out <laughs> and on that note we're coming back with our interview segment and the bottom line christian i'm out What do you think you're doing, Kevin? I uh, was just gonna drive home. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, there are several warning signs present that you shouldn't be driving. Like hearing voices? Like your text to emoji ratio? Oh man, the selfies. <laughs> Selfie nailed it. We all have warning signs that let us know that we're probably not okay to drive. Mine is pretending to be your subconscious. Craig, come on man, let's put a ride home. Focus, focus up. I'm talking to you, 55. Welcome to the neighborhood, my man. You can't hear or see that. Well, you probably see it, but you don't even know what's happening. You're like three weeks old, but welcome. This will be a good little memorabilia thing. Is that the word I'm looking for? Probably memory thing for you. Welcome back to the Rubio Method. This is episode 33. My name is Chris Rubio. We've got the interview segment with the great Rick Carr. Rick Carr, what is going on, my man? How are you, sir? It's good to see you again. Good to see you as well. Let me give you a little background on Rick. He's a civilian cold case homicide investigator in Arizona. I'm not even sure what that is, but it sounds very official and like I shouldn't want to know you. Is that is that about, about correct? Well, yeah, hopefully we never cross professionally in, in my profession. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And nobody like knows. Sort of so CSI. I'm know, sorry. It looks yeah, like a CSI it's, it's, stuff. Uh, basically a, a homicide that's been uh, unsolved for over a year, has been prosecuted in over years, technically a cold case homicide. So wow. I investigate those with the Phoenix Police Department. Over a year and you can still figure it out? Over, oh yeah, I mean, technology nowadays, it's it's so much, uh, so much has changed since when I was actually doing it uh, back in my Torrance days that it, it's unbelievable. But yeah, it's, uh, uh, technology is definitely a game changer for, uh, for homicide. Yeah, and the DNA will get you. Yes. DNA does not lie. People lie. DNA does not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Also, he was a director of athletic security. Yes, sir. At USC. That's all I, we're going to talk I didn't, about. I didn't hear. I, I, I missed that part, Chris. Well, I, I got gassy while saying it. That's the problem. He's the director. He was the director of athletic security at USC. Basically, he was like the right hand man. He, he, he saw everything. He was he was like the secret service of. USC football or just all of USC? All of athletics, athletics, but obviously the focus was on football. Of course, because there was so much nervousness around UCLA at that time. I get it. You're right. Okay. Can, can and I bring also, out the pictures I have of you and, and Sailor in your USC garb when you were uh, when hosting the camp that day? Christian, cut the film. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't want to talk about that right now. <laughs> and he's also a great father. Rick, welcome. I've got three quick hitters for you. Number yes, one, sir. what is your favorite Jack Nicholson movie? It's, uh, a Few Good Men. Oh, that's a good one. What's your second favorite? As Good As It Gets. That is such a good movie. What, what's, what about The Bucket List? I like The Bucket List. A little, little sad at the end, though. Uh, you know, Maybe not, you know, but again, 
uh, total Jack. He, he, he never, never lost, uh, never lost being Jack regardless. Uh, you know, at the end, uh, he, he still sticks it to Tommy. Who's got to climb up and, uh, on top of the mountain and, and, uh, bury him. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, the bucket list was fun, but uh, I, I love the, the line in bucket list where he goes, "Can I call you?" Morgan Freeman says, "Can I call you Tommy?" And he goes, "My actually name's Matthew, but he found it too religious or something like that." I roared so hard at that line. Really yeah. good movie. Yeah. You have to choose one. I'm, one. I'm buying a personal concert in your home. You have to choose one artist: Bob Seger, The Eagles, Neil Diamond, or The Rolling Stones. This is in your home personal concert. Bob Seger. Why? Uh, I always liked him, grew up with him. Uh, actually, it was the last concert I saw. Uh, and it was his rollout tour when he, when he came through uh, California. Uh, I would take any of them. Uh, we don't have time, but I have a, uh, later I can tell you a great Neil Diamond story about my daughter and with my daughter. Uh, Eagles, obviously growing up in, in the 70s and 80s, they were the hometown, uh, you know, hometown sound so any one of them but uh bob uh like i said it was his last tour he was probably uh you know he was 70 something and he just went out there and crushed it for for two hours he was awesome and he's got the kind of voice that i feel like no matter the acoustics in your home i feel like he'd thrive yeah and he just seems like a genuinely nice guy yeah and christian is very upset he just wrote one flew over the cuckoo's nest another good one another great one Okay. Okay. You know, Last I, quick I, question. What is your favorite food? Steak. How do you like it cooked? Medium. Okay. I'll, I'll accept that. Not too bad. Not too bad. All right. Let's get to the meat of this right away. Is college football broken? I think it is. Yes. In, in, a, in a word. Yes. Because of the NIL and the transfer portal, or is there other reasons? Uh, I, well, I, I think other reasons have, I think the fact, if you look back when you played and, and, you know, when you committed to somebody and, and you had four or five years, whatever that was, uh, you know, whether or not your coaches committed, I think part of it was uh, back in, in your day with the, you know, lack of uh, accountability, if you will, for coaches leaving you high and dry, bringing you in someplace and then leaving you high and dry. But again, you know, that's, that's part of life. You know, you, you have to make adjustments, you have to adapt, you have to overcome and, you know, it's lessons learned. But I think with um, the way it is today, where there is basically zero accountability and there's yeah. no rules in place. And I, I think that's a big, I, I'm not against the kids getting uh, money. I'm not against the kids, uh, you know, being able to switch schools if it's, if it's not a good fit. I'm certainly not against that, but you know, right now there, there's really nothing in place and it's the wild, wild west. Exactly what I was going to say. It's almost like the NCAA bowed down and they didn't have any idea what they were doing. It's like, okay, we got to do something. Let's just do it. And then they didn't realize, okay, we, we allowed the teenagers out, but we never gave them a curfew and we gave them unlimited ATM balance, you know, and yeah. it, it just, it, it's amazing to me that in my opinion, they didn't even think through it. No. And, you know, if you look at, well, is Emmert still there? Or did he leave? Who, where? Uh, the president of the NCAA. Uh, I, have, I have no idea. Okay. I, you know, I mean, uh, to quote Bob Seeger, you had a ship of fools running that place. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, when to, to, from a personal standpoint, when you have Paul D who oversaw one of the most um, egregious uh, rules violators at the University of Miami sitting on a, uh, a hearing and, and handing down punishments uh, for other schools, namely USC, when uh, was, what, did Reggie break the rules? Yes, absolutely. The, the rules in place. Did, you know, what happened to him and the rest of the uh, um, school or the uh, rest of the program deserve what they got? Absolutely not. You know, you, yeah. you look at Miami under his his reign and, and what Reggie did, it's it's not even close. And, you know, take away in a Heisman Trophy, regardless if he got paid or not, he was the best player on the on the field that year. You know, yeah, he, he was an absolute freak. And Christian says, Charlie Baker, is that the person you're looking for? Uh, he might be the new guy. So, okay. I mean, when, you know, honestly, my, like my tenure, it was, it was all Emmert when, when he was there. 
Or okay, whatever. so if you're fixing, because you're so involved, yeah, he's the new NCAA president. If you're yeah. so involved with college football, obviously you were a huge part of it. That's how you and I started to know each other. Your son, JR, phenomenal yes. long snapper. I went to South High. South High, yeah. How the hell did I remember that? Okay. Uh, and he went <laughs> through college. What would, you, what would you do to fix it? Well, I, it, for me, I think, you know, one, and, and again, you played with, uh, you know, a, such a diverse group. You know, mm -hmm. coming to L.A., coming to wherever. Obviously, Jer went down to uh, Tennessee. So, but, you know, you take a group of, you take a locker room. And, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's come different backgrounds, very, uh, very diverse. But they have one, one uh, common goal, and that's to win games. And you don't mm -hmm. have to be best friends off the field, you don't have to, you know, whatever. But, you know, during the week, during the season, you've got a purpose. And it's, it's about, you know, attaining that. And it's about... You know, as you know, you know, finding that fit, make, getting that culture where everybody's bought in and yes. doing that. So, you know, a lot of these kids coming from different backgrounds and things like that they don't all have the same advantages, uh, whatever you want to call it, when when they get there. So, I think to make it even for everybody involved, I think you start a savings account for these kids from mm -hmm. day one, and let's say it's ten thousand a year. Let's say it's fifteen thousand a year. And regardless if you're, you know, Kayla Williams and winning Heisman trophies, or if, you know, you're, you know, long snapping at whatever college and regardless, you're getting that. If, and if you want to make an NIL deal on top of that, that's fine. But the college, okay. That, that you're working for, as you know, it, it's a job. A hundred percent. Yeah. That you're working for that, you know, you, you have body parts and aren't working now because of that, because of the time True. you spent there. You give them 15,000 a year, you keep it in an account for them. And when they leave, okay, they've got that money. And now that's a pretty nice, you know, uh, nest egg to start with uh, going in the world when you're 22, 23 years old. Hell yeah. And, you know, th that's what I would do as far as, you know, how are we going to make this equitable for everybody? You know, yeah. the same as count. So you're saying the, a third string kicker, because that's the, obviously the lowest position on the team. You're saying even they get about 10 grand and just put it away. And if Caleb Williams signs a $10 million Dodge Durango deal, he gets that plus that, but it's still put in the, the, the safe. Sure. Again, because he, you know, what, what's he doing? And, uh, and maybe, you know, again, because there's no rules in place, but maybe make it, you need a three-year commitment to, Ooh, to like keep that. that money. I like that a lot. You know, you need you need that time because, you know, the, the school's investing in you. Obviously, you're getting an education out of this. And again, you know, some of these kids are not getting, you know, coached up right from, um, you know, family members and, and hangers on and things of that nature, people of that nature that they don't realize, hey, you know, 10 years from now, um, am I going to have, you know, am I going to have a degree or not? And if I have a degree, I'm going to be able to do a lot more things than if I don't. Yeah, OK, I got you. Over the over the last couple of years, there's been one of the dumbest statements, in my opinion, going around. Where at the first time I heard it, I thought it was a joke. I thought it was like almost watching a Saturday Night Live skit when they started the whole the fund the police mov movement, where in cities where you need to fund more police, in my opinion, the bad city equals more cops. Yes, you're going to have some bad cops. You're going to have some bad teachers. You're going to have some bad doctors. How do we get more people to become cops nowadays, especially like in the inner cities where New York has a mass exodus of cops going to Florida? Because uh, was it Santos was paying cops, I think, five grand to come down. H how do we get more cops? We, we need more cops. This is my opinion. Well, and thanks. You know, yes, we do. And I think but that comes with a culture change that comes with people realizing that, you know, yeah, there are bad people in every profession. It doesn't matter who you are. OK. And let's let's go back to George Floyd, where most of this started with. Mm -hmm. um, Derek Chauvin was a bad cop. Yeah. Okay. There's not a cop in America that would say kneeling on somebody's neck, okay, is a proper restraint. Not happening. Okay. You know, George Floyd should not have ingested uh, fentanyl prior to you know uh, encountering the cops or at any time actually, but. Yeah. Okay, so you have you have a bad cop, you got to make bad decisions. Okay, you have a perfect storm. What happens? He dies while in police custody. Why? If we are a country of laws, a nation of laws. Okay, so what should happen to, to Chauvin? He should be fired, which he was. He should be prosecuted, which he was, and he should go to prison, which is where he currently is. 
Okay. So we have a nation of laws. So, okay, we've done what we can. Yes, it was a tragedy. Okay. But, you know, the same thing if, if you went out and murdered somebody, okay, uh, you know, you should go to, you should be arrested, you should go to prison, and, you know, life goes on. But uh, obviously, you know, and I'm the guy that believes that, you know, people in law enforcement should be held to a higher standard. So, um, you no, know, it's not just another murder. It's it's a black eye for law enforcement. But we've got to get that culture back to where we are defending these people and they are going to make mistakes. But we need people out there. We need education. The people, you know, having worked in um, a, um, a less, uh, what do you call it, less, uh, you know, a poor socioeconomic uh, city uh, when I started, it, uh, you know, the people, the 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 citizens want you there because they're afraid of, of the, you know, of the thugs. And so as far as defunding police, so what are you going to get? You're defunding police. So you're, you're losing um, protection, pr protection. You're losing experience. You're losing uh, quality people. It, it, so let's compare it to, to football. So let's quit. Let's defund the NFL. And what are you going to have? You're going to have a, a sport. Nobody wants to watch because yeah, it's right. not going to be the, the premier sport that it is because yeah, you're not going to have tag athletes not coached well. Yeah. You're not you're going to have, so you're getting, you're cutting, uh, you're cutting funding. So you can't hire quality people. So the people that you do have, you're not able to train them as much, which, mm -hmm. you know, um, regardless of what Alan Iverson thinks, you know, it's all about practice. It's all about, <laughs> training, you know, and in anything, you know, and, uh, so that's the defunding the police is, is yeah, I agree. One of the dumbest things you could ever do, but we've got to get back as a nation and, uh, get people in, in place that, you know, believe in, Hey, we need to protect people. And this is how yeah. we do it. We get rid of the people that don't do it. Chauvin, you're in prison in the story. We don't need to burn down cities 3000 miles away from where this incident occurred that had people had nothing to do with it that are, you know, running, uh, you know, stores and, and they're, you know, we don't need to ruin their livelihoods because of some idiot, uh, police officer that encountered a guy that made a bad choice. And, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not taking, you know, I'm not absolving, um, um, Chauvin. Chauvin in any, any sense of the imagination. He, he needs to be in prison. That's where he should be. Okay. But Floyd, you know, made some bad choices prior to that. So come back to accountability. We, we, we don't have a culture of accountability in, in America anymore. I don't think. Yeah, we need to start that. Speaking of accountability, I think one of the reasons that you and I have always gotten along really well is that we're both no BS type of people. I, why do you think that more people aren't that way? Because to me, it's it's a lot easier. I, I, I'm not I'm not a liar, so I don't ever have to remember anything. I just I talk. And I, you, you know, whatever I told you about JR, you told me, it's like, okay, there's no, oh, what did I say? What did I say? I said what the hell was on my mind because it was the truth. Why are there not more men like that? Well, I, I think, you know, it goes back to, you know, let's look at your background in athletics. And I think if you look at a certain segment of society, you know, that's going to, um, you know, you didn't get, you didn't get, uh, uh, you didn't make the team at uh, UCLA because of your smile, because of your last name, because of your skin color. You made it because your ability mm -hmm. and so your background everything that you know your formative years it was all about ability okay accountability and what's it going to take to get to that next level and i can tell you this that from day one uh, you know and and i've always told jr that um uh, as well you know it, it's about getting uh getting better and you know, people that want to be politically correct or, you know, if you want to look at, uh, you know, uh, De Niro and, and what's his name and the Fockers, you know, I didn't know they had ninth place medals, you know, <laughs> <laughs> ben Stiller. Well, for what, you know, um, but no, yeah. And being a straight shooter, no BS, it is the easiest because again, you don't have to remember lies. And if you're going to hurt somebody's feelings, you know, it, it's not intentional, but you're telling them the truth. And that old adage, sometimes the truth hurts. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, you're, and that's what one of the things that, like I said, I love about you is, um, you know, I watched, you know, um, how, however many camps, you know, <laughs> enough of them. And, you know, I didn't care, you know, who it was, the, the first kid, the last kid, you know, they were getting coached up the same. 
They were being held to the same standard and whether or not they had that ability, you would let them know at the end of the day. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll never forget, uh, JR's second, second Vegas didn't make the top 12 mm -hmm. and it was, was crushed was just, I mean, you know, it's one of those, you know, if you remember, uh, the old commercial, you know, you want to give him a lifesaver, you know, cause he feels so bad. <laughs> Um, you know, so you're a father and you're trying to, you know, trying to, you know, uh, console him lighten, him, lighten the mood. But, you know, I said, Hey, he's, he's telling you, this is where you want to be. Where do you want to be next year? You want to be, mm -hmm. we don't want to be, you know, going out to breakfast. Now we want to be getting ready for the finals or whatever. And again, it was, it was something that, you know, he got it hurt. Okay. But again, hard lessons move on. Um, where do you want to be? And, you know, it's like the, everybody says, you know, I want to I want to do this. You know, OK, well, what's your plan? Well, I'm going to do A, B and C. Well, that's great. OK, so you want to you want to be a champion. So you're going to you're going to work hard, but you're willing to put in the time. Mm -hmm. You know, how many times between and I, I you know, you could correct me as as far as, you know, I want to say the monthly workouts at, at uh, Notre Dame or maybe every other month at Notre Dame, you know, but the working out in between that. And you'd be able to tell when the kids got there, whether or not they were doing it or not. And then it came time, you know, in the summertime for the top 12s and the Vegas and all that. And so, yeah, it, it, it's all about, you know, uh, preaching accountability, which you always have. And, you know, I've, I've been a big fan of it. I love that. We've already spoken for 20 minutes. We're going over, but I have to ask you this one question. Yes, sir. This, this show is about men's middle, mid, middle aged men's and their health. How, how do we fix them right now? Or are they too broken? So many of them, because to me, there's such a fine line between, yes, you have to be soft, but you still got to be hard. Like wh where is the fine line and how do we fix it nowadays? You know, I think, and I, I deal a lot with this, um, you know, mental health as, as far as, you know, law enforcement, because obviously you see a lot of, you know, bad things, but uh, I think it's, you know, talking about it as you, you know, as you have brought it up and it, obviously that's, that's part of your, um, you know, your program and making people more aware of it, like anything else, like education, like what, you know, what are we doing to, how do we fix America, educate people? You know, this, this is what it's going to take to, to fix things. How do you, you know, how do you get smart kids? You educate them. And for too long and, and you know, just definitely the wrong way to do it. Uh, if somebody was involved in a, a traumatic incident in law enforcement, you know, slap on the back and, hey, way to go, kid, and, and move on and go out and get drunk. And, you know, hey, you know, you're a guy now. You're, you're, you're a dude because you're in a shooting. Well, that's, that's horrible. You know, not, you know, not only is it, you know, bad for your body, but your mind and everything else. And everybody's going to react differently as, as far as what, you know, what makes you stress out, what makes me, you know, how something affects you, whatever, you know. And, you know, but by talking about it, by getting it out there and realizing that, hey, you know, this guy is, you know, 6'6", 260 and, you know, can can do whatever. But he's still, you know, at the end of the day things are going to affect him and it doesn't make him uh, any less of a man uh, because things do affect him. Being sensitive does not make you less of a man. Now there's obviously times you can't be sensitive and there's, yeah, well. there's, there's time for it. But, you know, I always, you know, when I was, you know, uh, training guys, I'd say, hey, you know, there's time for execution. There's time for motion. When you're on the field. It's about execution. After that, there's emotion. So, uh, I, you know, I think, I think, you, you know, you're definitely on the right path as, as far as making it a topic and, and getting the, getting the word out there that, Hey, it's okay. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. And I would agree that there's a lot of guys, um, uh, you know, especially in law enforcement, you see, you know, suicides because, you know, people have these issues, but they're afraid to talk about them. Rick, this was phenomenal. Where can people find out more about you? Is it just LinkedIn? Yeah, just LinkedIn. If uh, if, somebody, if you want my number and give me a call because I, I I do teach uh, teach a few things. I'm actually uh, writing a book called uh, Locker Room Lessons for Law Enforcement because I think a lot of a lot of parallels between you know teamwork, between uh, you know practicing, uh, you know sacrifice things of that nature. I I think you know when when I was involved in recruiting, I was always trying to get the athletes into the law enforcement because they understood okay. what it took to you know the dedication and the, and the time and and all that. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, Rick Carr, 1853 at Gmail is my, um, uh, email. Perfect. Go ahead and write me. 
Rick, I really appreciate your time. We're coming back with the bottom line right after this. Christian, I'm out. What do you think you're doing, Kevin? I uh, was just gonna drive home. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, there are several warning signs present that you shouldn't be driving. Like hearing voices? Like your text to emoji ratio? Oh man, the selfies. <laughs> Selfie nailed it. We all have warning signs that let us know that we're probably not okay to drive. Mine is pretending to be your subconscious. Craig, come on man, let's put a ride home. Focus, focus up. I'm talking to you, Christian. Thanks for splitting this up. We actually had to film this in two different segments because someone's wireless service did not work. We won't say who, Rick Carr. All right, but anyway, welcome back to the Rubio Method. This is episode 33. My name is Chris Rubio. I really appreciate you coming back for the bottom line. Keep sharing on YouTube, Amazon, Google, Spotify, and of course, Apple and the NGBN.TV network. If you have any questions for myself, Monhan, or Rick Carr, you can email rubio at therubiomethod.com. Now, let's talk about the bottom line. The bottom line is all the stuff you should have learned without even realizing you learned it. Number one. Let technology be your friend and help you. Remember, Monahan was talking about telehealth. I had no idea what it even was, and Monahan barely got it out. But we learned that you can actually do Zoom meetings with doctors all over the world. He said, what do you say, Switzerland? That's pretty impressive, all right? So number one, let technology be your friend and help you. Number two, try different things because you might like them and you might hate them, but at least you will know for sure. This goes back to the email question about us being cultured and how Monahan is not cultured. He said he was for a second, but he's not because he doesn't go to plays or operas. And I'm partially cultured because I like plays unless they're stupid ones like Hamilton. So number two, try different things because you might like them and you might hate them, but at least you'll know for sure. And the last one, number three, not all changes are good. Everyone says, oh, you got to make some changes. You got to make some changes. Not all changes are good. In my opinion, what's happened to football over the last couple of years, not so good. Like Rick Carr and I spoke about the defund the police movement, in our opinion, not very good. So that's the bottom line. We got all three of them. That's all the stuff you should have learned. I hope you had a great time. I did. Thank you once again to Christian and Monahan and Rick Carr. Next episode, episode 34, coming out in two weeks. Christian, I'm out.